Law Unit of the Philosophical Society. Uh, first of all, we would like to thank uh, Professor Trianta Filos Guat for agreeing to participate in the meeting. I would like uh, I would also like to thank Yahya Barkov Village for his help in organizing this meeting. I give the floor to Mr. Gulic uh, for the moderation of the meeting. Uh, yes. Thank you very much, Professor Uh, uh, uh but, but, I may request first of all you will uh, you may introduce yourself and after that, Professor Guas. Yeah, sure. Uh, yeah. I'm currently uh, an assistant professor of legal philosophy and sociology at Bursolda University Faculty of Law. Uh, well, I basically study research in the field of uh, legal normativity. So that's the, that's the focus. And everything else just falls around it. So it's a quite classical uh, field of study. Uh, well, that's basically it. I mean, uh, there is no need to say anything more on me today. Uh, because the important part is our uh, guest, Trianta Filos Gubas. Um, but before I start, I would like to thank the uh, Philosophical Society of Turkey because, for organizing this event. This is hopefully the first of many, so we will entertain uh, many other guests here and talk about the recent work that has been uh, you know, produced in the field of legal philosophy. So I think that's pretty much a first in Turkey and also uh, it's an exciting first because there might be, you know, many promising opportunities coming up, you know, coming out of these discussions. And that's what I hope, uh, at least. So I thank Professor uh, Uygur for allowing me to uh, actually establish contact with Professor Buas and organize this meeting. And I, I hope that it's going to be uh, a joy for everyone participating. Now, without further ado, I would like to uh, shortly uh, introduce uh, briefly introduce our guest guest today. Uh, Professor Guas uh, has a PhD in legal philosophy from the University of Antwerp. The title of the dissertation is The Law's Humility, the Possibility of Metajurisprudence. Uh, the scope of the philosophical inquiry uh, prominently includes the metaethics, philosophy of law, moral and political philosophy following uh, the accomplishment, the finishing of his PhD. Now, his first postdoctoral appointment was at Monash University uh, in the years 2016 and 2017. It was a part of an Australian Research Council research project, which was titled uh, Constraining Statutes, the Interaction Between a Statute's Linguistic Content and Principles of Statutory Construction. He was then appointed as a part-time lecturer in the legal theory at the University of Glasgow School of Law in the years of 2019 and 2020. Uh, and uh, his responsibilities included teaching at both levels of uh, graduate, at, at undergraduate level and also at postgraduate level. And he currently has a three-year postdoctoral appointment at Carlos III University of Madrid uh, that involves research and theories uh, of economic and social justice. He also teaches in the fields of human rights, sociology, uh, and theory of law and philosophy of law. His research project, his current research project, is titled Productive Justice, a Case for a Work Conditional Social Minimum, uh, which provides a critical evaluation of the strategy of prioritizing goals of labor politics. His publications overall range over a broad domain of topics in philosophy of law, theories of justice, human rights, and normative ethics. He is the author of two monographs, Law's Humility, Enlarging the Scope of Jurisprudential, Jurisprudential Disagreement, which was published by, by Bloomsbury in uh, 2021. And the uh, topic for today's discussion, The Place of Coercion in Law, which was published by Cambridge Elements in the Philosophy of Law series, well, Cam Cambridge University Press in 2023. Now, uh, as far as uh, I understand, the uh, speech is going to last for approximately four to five minutes, but which will include some input from the audience as well and uh, after which we can proceed with a period of discussion uh, if that is okay for everyone but i'm open to suggestions so i'm not by all means a, an experienced moderator so please forgive my rookie, rookie mistakes if i make any uh, 
Professor Uygur, that's all from me. If everything is uh, fine, I would like to yield the floor now to Professor Guas uh, for his presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. So may I proceed? I, I assume yes, you may. Thank you so much. So once again, this is a great pleasure. As far as I understood, I'm also part of something very new that is being launched. So that makes me double happy. Huh? And this is a wonderful occasion. Once again, I would like to thank Yahya. I mean, for me, Yahya was a revelation a year ago when we first met in Bucharest at the um, IDR International Congress. And, you know, we had a very good rapport. And it's so nice to see you again, Yahya. And I hope we meet again soon in person. Um, so before I go into any further details, I just, I, I just like to sketch out the way I thought we could go through the parts of the book that I suggested I just spend some time reading, because as you remember, I said that, you know, in, in, in such a context, um, a book symposium should be as focused as possible. And for that reason, I had suggested that we could go through together from pages 20 up to um, page, let me tell you exactly, so it's page 27, so pages 20 to 27 of this small book is actually a booklet that Cambridge Elements classifies it as a monograph. Um, and more precisely, the methodology that I'd like to follow, so I, I use this um, Mickey Mouse level Latin expression, which is lege mecum, which literally means read with me, uh, which means that I, I will focus on certain passages. I will try to give some explanation as to the background of these passages. And then I am... I would be delighted if you would like to interject while I am doing this reading in case something looks unclear or you would like me to connect it with other parts perhaps of the book that you might have already read. It is entirely up to you. But I think this more dialogical version of going slowly through such certain sentences of the seven pages of the book is a more pleasant and productive way, you know, of, of having a discussion. Okay? So... Before saying anything, um, first of all, the title of the book, so The Place of Coercion in Law. If, if I was asked to be even more precise about this title, and if Cambridge also allowed me to use more thick, let's say, titles, so longer descriptions, I would say that the full title will be The Place of Coercion in Legal, not just in Legal Theory, but in Jurisprudential Theories. In other words, the target of this book is to provide a principled way in which we can meaningfully disagree about the importance of coercion in law. And the critical part, of course, here is the we. Who is the we? Well, this is the twist that this book tries to make. The we is not just all of us legal philosophers. The we is represented by particular legal theories that have something to say, not just about coercion, but also about the nature of law in general. In other words, what I'm trying to do is to single out those possibilities where two otherwise competing theories about the nature of law can nevertheless be compared to each other in a meaningful way with regard to a specific question. And this specific question is, in which way and to which degree is coercion relevant and important for the law? So that is the background. Now, um, you might have also seen, for those who do have the time to go through other parts of the book also, that this book is divided in two basic components. One is what I call the taxonomical parts, and the other one is the changing the question part. So the taxonomical part is nothing original at all. So all I'm doing is I am trying to classify because, and the reason for that is that uh, this series, so Cambridge Elements, is a series that is, of course, it is addressed to to an academic audience, but at the same time, it 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 is supposed to provide something like a state of the art explanation of what is currently going on in research on a specific topic. So I had to provide something, and that something that I decided to provide was a taxonomy, as I called it, of theories, legal theories, and by legal I mean jurisprudential 
which is an awkward way in English to, to say legal philosophical. That's what I mean. So legal philosophical theories about coercion. So that, that is the first part. This first part is not entirely relevant to what follows because I use the basic axis of this distinction that I use to taxonomize different theories also for the purposes of my own proposal, if you like. And just to briefly say that, what I mean by that is that in the first part of the book, I say that talking in very, very, very broad terms, we could, let's say, position different legal philosophical theories about coercion on two sides of a distinction, as I call it. And this distinction has to do with two different ways, I say, in which coercive action and coercive practices within a legal system are normatively relevant, are normatively compelling. Some might also say, I ah, do you mean how, for example, they provide reasons for action? Yes, that is one way of putting it, but I want to have an understanding of normativity that is as broad as possible. So it's not just about necessarily reasons for action. It could also be about values. It could be about other concepts that certain philosophers take to be normatively basic. For example, duties, obligations, facts about rightness. There is even a new trend now in Anglo-Saxon ethics that talks about the concept of fittingness as a normatively basic concept. So the whole idea about attitudes and whether attitudes are fitting responses to certain events or situations. So against the background of this understanding of normativity, in the first part of the book, I say that there are two main, so far at least, ways of, let's say, carving the normative universe at its joints. One is to take a deontic, de let's say, perspective on, on the normative world, and the other one is to take an axiological perspective. For most of you, this also might look similar to the distinction between the good, so the axiological, and the right, hmm? the deontic. More or less, that is true. It's just that I'm trying to pack into more, you know, further distinctions and current developments that also talk about some other concepts. But this is basically the idea. And what I'm suggesting there, so I'm grouping different theories on the basis of this distinction. So I'm saying that certain jurisprudential theories talk about coercion as being relevant, as I say, in a deontic way. And certain other legal philosophical theories about coercion talk about coercion in an axiologically relevant way. And then I say that there are different ways, of course, in which you can add further content into this thing. So, for example, a theory can be treat coercion as axiologically relevant by associating coercion with different values. For example. Or a theory can understand coercion as deontically relevant by either associating coercion with the enforcement of rights or associating coercion with some account of legal obligation. So there are many avenues there, okay? But this is the basic criterion of the division. So that's the first part. And I say that this first part rests on a current way of understanding the disagreement between theories about legal coercion, which I say is very, very, very modal in its nature. And what do I mean by that? Well, so far, the way in which in, in, you know, in, in our dominant Anglo-American, Anglo-Saxon way of doing analytic philosophy, which of course is up for debate whether this is the right way, but let's suppose that this is the currently dominant way. So in this, con in this context, um, coercion uh, comes into the picture in the following way. First of all, we take coercion in its form as an adjective, so it's a adjectival version, coercive. And we ask the question, so we say, we affirm, uh, law or legal practices are coercive, or they are not coercive. And then we qualify this statement in modal terms. So we might say that uh, law is necessarily coercive, or law is contingently coercive. And all the rest, follows from this very basic way of starting to talk about why coercion is important for law. So coerciveness is understood as a kind of a property, if you like, of either legal practices or legal systems, or of course, sometimes individual legal norms. That's a huge 
you know, po um, topic of discussion on its own, but it's a property. And then we ask, is this property born by legal norms, by legal systems, by legal practices necessarily or contingently? And there you have an explosion of different views, which in my humble, humble view, sometimes they look as if they're either doing what is called hair splitting. So they're trying to split just one hair into two parts, or they seem to be talking about different things. That was my original worry. So my way of going past this model approach, as I called it, has certain challenges, if you like. If I want to go past the model approach, that I cannot do simply within the context of legal philosophy. I need to challenge the very utility of model discussion in general and say, you know what? There is an alternative way of talking about the way things could have been different. This is the model equation. And this way is also a reductive understanding of modality itself. Because if I am trapped within the model framework, how can I displace that and then start talking about law in non-model terms without defending an alternative vision to the model vision? So that's already challenging. And for that, I owe my entire argument, if you like, to a book that I consider to be one of the best recent contributions on, on the nature of modality. And this book, which I also mentioned in the pages I suggested that you read, is written by an American philosopher whose name is Boris Kment. Boris Kment. And the title of his book, just to remind you, so I have the book in front of me, it's called Modality and Explanatory Reasoning. It's an Oxford University uh, book that came out, let me tell you exactly when, so it was in 2014. So 2014, Boris Kment. Modality and explanatory reasoning. And what Kmen does there is he tells you that modality in and of itself is not metaphysically deep. Okay? It's more like a way of using language. What is metaphysically deep are certain comparative relations across different worlds, let's say. I'm not using the word possible worlds because the word possible is already modeled. Okay? Across different worlds. And he says that what is metaphysically deep and meaningful is not the expressions necessary or contingent, but something that lies underneath these expressions, which is not in itself genuinely model. So that's one thing. That's the thing about modality in general, the big picture. On the other hand, another challenge that I had is how I could replace this very ordinary way of talking about coercive legal systems or coercive legal norms in a way that I'm not, that doesn't put me in the blameworthy position of having to defend myself that I'm simply changing the topic of the discussion. This is always my worry. Am I changing the topic here? Am I saying something that is completely unrelated to what has been said so far about coercion in law? So for that reason, I when I try to do that, I always try to, to begin in the most naive way possible. And you know what the most naive way possible could be in the case of coercion? Well, it would be to say that, okay, some start with the idea that coercion is a property or a condition uh, of legal systems or legal norms. And I'm saying, okay, what if coercion, in the sense of coercive or coerciveness, is not a property? What if it's a quality? Quality, in the same way, for example, that colors are quality. If that were the case, then we could also talk about some systems being more or less coercive in the same way that we can say something falls more on the red side of the color spectrum or on the non-red side, uh, side of the color spectrum. Okay. But then I started thinking, okay, this looks very empirical, right? And that's not going to take me very far away at the level of metaphysics unless I put too much into it. So I didn't like the quality approach. So I didn't like to say that, you know what, coerciveness is a matter of degree, how much huh? legal systems are coercive, and the real disagreement is about the how much of the coerciveness. That could be a question, by the way. This is a legal sociological question, for example. Huh? It's an absolutely legitimate question, but I don't think it has metaphysical and analytic depth. So the alternative that I thought was the following. 
And that, of course, necessitates the addition of some complexity. Mm -hmm. The complexity is the following. I said that I think that what really matters here is not coercion in and of itself. It is coercion, as coercion is used in the context of a particular legal philosophical theory. And moreover, what really matters is not coercion in itself, but what I call its relevance. So for me, the, the word relevance is the real metaphysical depth here, right? And I take the courage and liberty of using this, this concept because it's a concept that has been um, let's say, um, very abundantly used over the last more or less 15 years across the board of analytic philosophy. So that includes epistemology, metaphysics, so the notion of relevance, explanatory relevance. It's everywhere. And of course, it's, it's huge discussion about how relevance matters and what it actually means. But there's a very intuitive way in which that is relevant also for law. And just to add something else in this, in this regard, I don't know whether you are familiar with... Um, I think that was that came out in Ratio Juris twenty years ago. Uh, there was an article by Nikos Stavropoulos from Oxford called uh, "The Legal Relevance of Coercion" or something like that. So this expression has been used before. It just as Stavropoulos, you know, approached it in a non-metaphysical way through Dworkin's view of coercion. But it's already there. I mean, we it makes sense to say, okay, is that really relevant for law? So that is the question now. I say that this question, which can be answered through statements, so coercion is legally relevant in this particular way. In which particular way? Well, from the first part of the book, I already have the two ways in which it can be legally relevant. Coercion, for example, one theory might say, is relevant in a specific deontic way. Or another theory might say, coercion is relevant not in this specific theontic way, but another specific theontic way. And another theory might say the same about the axiological way in which coercion can be relevant. So, for example, someone might say that coercion is relevant in legal systems because it makes it more likely that social peace will prevail. By the way, this is the opinion of Kenneth Einar Kima in his latest book about coercion in law. This is what he actually says in the very end that it is a condition for the maintenance of social peace. Okay, this is a typically archaeological statement about the way in which coercion becomes legally relevant. Now, I say that this is exactly the type of statements that we should take up when we try to understand why different theories disagree with each other about this issue. So the disagreement is something about the notion of the relevance of coercion in law. But in order to make things a little bit more interesting, and in order for me to be able to make comparisons between theories, I took a step further and I said the following. Okay, these are statements about relevance. And these statements can be true or false, depending, of course, on your criteria that you use. Now, what can we say about these truths if they are true? And this is precisely the moment when we talk about truths about the legal relevance of coercion in law, I repeat, truths about the legal relevance of coercion, hmm? we take this expression and we say, we ask the following question. How safe are these truths from the point of view of a particular legal theory? Now you might say, what word exactly are you using here? The word safe? Safety. By the way, Boris Kment himself uses the word security in his book. He talks about the security of truth. I prefer the word safety for various reasons. One reason being that safety is also used in epistemology when we talk about safe beliefs, by the way. But that's one reason. That being said, if you don't like this word, there is another way to more or less express the same idea. And this is the following. How difficult is for certain truths about the legal relevance of coercion to be falsified? The notion of difficulty or easiness, if you like. Certain truths, and this is what Boris, Boris Men says, are easier to be falsified, and certain other truths are harder 
to be falsified, for example. And this is another way of saying that certain truths are very secure or safe. This is also the, the meaning of the word, this ugly English word that I used, inexorable. Inexorable. It means something that resists in a very forceful way. In this particular case, resists what? Falsification. So on this alternative model, the modality doesn't play a metaphysically basic role. Why? Because the idea is that the concept of necessity and contingency can be replaced by the notions of truth security, if you like, or truth safeness. You might say, of course, that the word inexorability has a modality in it because it's the ability in the world. But this is, I think, is linguistic coincidence of, you know, of Latin. But anyway, we could discuss that. So one is truth security, and the other, the other is what Kment in his book and what I also apply in my book calls the notion of distance or departure from actuality. So the idea more or less is the following, that a certain truth is very secure, a truth about anything is very secure. This is the way you're talking about necessity in this time. So very secure means necessary, just that you make it a matter of degree instead of a matter of either or. It's either necessary or contingent. No, no, no. Here we need gradation, gradation. So the idea becomes a truth is very secure, safe, or difficult to be falsified. Farther you can take it from the context of actuality, where this truth still remains there. In other words, it resists falsification, regardless of whether you, in a, metaf in a metaphorical way, you take this truth, you take it outside of the actual content and you place it in another world that looks so different from our actual. And nevertheless, the key here is the nevertheless. And nevertheless, this statement, this proposition, this scenario remains true, despite the fact that the world in which we have placed it in is very different from what we take to be the actual world, right? So this is the very intuitive idea. How do I use that now in the, in the case of law? Remember what I said, that this is about theory. And by theories, I mean legal philosophical theory. So the idea is as, is, goes as follows. I say the following. First of all, you cannot have a genuine legal philosophical or jurisprudential theory that only talks about coercion. Every genuine, autonomous, complete, comprehensive jurisprudential theory is a theory whose basic core is not coercion, but something else. The basic core is a theory of how law is made at the first place. You cannot talk about coercion of law, which means the coercive enforcement of law, without having first something to enforce. That something that is being enforced has to be made into law on pain of contradiction. So first you need to make something and then we can discuss how that something becomes or comes coercive or is enforced, okay? It's a matter of conceptual priorities here. So any theory that we should take seriously into account is a theory that definitely has a component that talks to you about how a law is made. That's one part. And then, if this theory is really rich, it will also have to tell you things about other things. So not just about how law is made, but also about how law is applied. So this is basically about judicial reasoning and also about how law and whether law is enforced. Okay, this is the moment of coercion. And a theory that has everything to say about all these matters is a super comprehensive theory. It is a very aspiring theory, perhaps, Dworkin's Law's Empire. I mean, I think the word empire between Dworkin's book is precisely this idea. He wanted it to be a fully comprehensive theory. So a theory that has to, things to say both about how law is made, how law is applied, and what it is to enforce the law. Mm -hmm. That makes it comprehensive. So in this book, my book, I say that I can only give you a model to compare theories that are, are, are as comprehensive as the following, they have an idea of how law is made, 
and they tell you something about the enforcement of law. I leave the notion of the application of law to the side. Huh? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's necessary for the comparison, but I definitely need an account of how law is made. And here's what I do in this. I say, okay, we want to we have two theories that are in disagreement or discussion between them. And we want to be sure, and they disagree about the legal relevance of coercion. And we want to make sure whether their disagreement is deep, meaningful, and more importantly, is there a way that we can make progress on this disagreement? In other words, is there a way to bring these two parts closer to each other by filling in some gaps or by suggesting some adjustments in either theory? That's the point of dealing with disagreements to eventually resolve them, okay? So I say that, let's suppose that we have two theories and we want to compare them. We take one theory uh, and we take this theory as our point of departure, conventionally, we just pick one, a comprehensive theory. And we say, okay, let me treat this theory as my point of departure to make any other comparison. What this book says is that there is a way to see, for example, first, how this theory sees coercion in the following way. You take that part of the theory that talks about how law is made. You regiment it in a way that I explain in the book to be almost synonymous with the notion of legal actuality. There is this part in, in half of the uh, seven pages that talks about this. And then you do the following, you say, so this theory, for example, tells you that laws are made, um, uh, are sensitive to normative truth. So you are a legal, for example, anti-positivist or a natural law theorist. And also it tells you that when laws are individuated in a normative way, these laws are also important. So they guide action in a deontic way. For example, they give you reasons for action. This is a typical legal theory, typical, okay? It tells you that laws, so legal norms, if you like, are individuated also through normative considerations, the making, and then it tells you that these laws are legally normative or relevant by giving you reasons for action. So that's one statement of how I understand the act legal actuality through the point of view of a particular theory. So that, that's the actuality. And then we do the following thought experiment, because this is a thought experiment. We say, okay, now let's suppose that this theory that talks about this particular way in which law is made and is legally relevant, this theory also has something to say about the legal relevance of coercion. How do I measure this? How do I measure the security of the truth of statements that this theory makes about the importance of coercion? And I say the following. The way to do this is to do the following experiment. To say, let's suppose that the person who wrote this theory takes off from the actuality of the theory, it departs, takes on a journey to other worlds, and tries to travel, uh, the mind who thought this theory, to travel to some other worlds, worlds constructed by other minds. Uh, and in these other minds, uh, law is made and becomes relevant in a very different way, in a very different way. But let's suppose that the person who comes from the actuality takes in his or her baggage only those statements that are about the importance of coercion. And let's suppose you take this baggage to these other worlds that differ. Why? Because law there is understood to be made in a very different way. So the thing that you actually enforce in this other world is another thing. In one theory, the thing that you enforce is normatively individuated and gives reason for action. In another theoretical world, the thing that you enforce can be something that is individuated only by empirical criteria. And the only way in which it is important is because it promotes the interests of the sovereign, for example. Hmm? Completely different way, let's suppose. Okay? So in this completely different world, I ask, will the statement about the way in which coercion is relevant the statement that you made also in the actual world. Will this just this statement remain true from the viewpoint of that very different world? Well, I say, if this statement, for example, coercion 
coercive actions are individuated in a descriptive way and they provide reasons for action. Let's give you an example. If this statement remains true from the lives of the different worlds, that means that we have a case where this truth is super strong. And why is it super strong? Well, because the new context in which you have placed this statement remains true despite the fact that the new context and the original context you used to talk about the actuality of how law is made according to the original theory are very far from each other. I will not go into any details about how to explain the far. There is something that I say that also Kment says that we understand the distance in terms of, of, of certain parameters. So for example, two worlds, two different worlds conceived by two different jurisprudential minds are more similar, so less different, if, for example, they share the same metaphysic. In particular case, it could be that Two theories of law that construct two different legal worlds are quite similar if both of them, for example, understand the individuation of legal norms and legal practices in descriptive rather than normative terms. So they coincide on the metaphysical part. And I say that second, in terms of priority, comes similarity, not in the way in which acts of coercion or acts of lawmaking, as I call it, are individuated metaphysically, but the normative relevance part, which is, okay, suppose that they are individuated descriptively. What makes these descriptive individuated actions or norms relevant? Then a theory might say can be axiological or deontic. And I say that similarity in this respect is the second degree, let's say, of similarity. And I give some examples as to how we can use this to understand, given a particular point of departure, how far away we are when we make a particular statement about the coercion in law. So before I go any further, because I know that this is already too much, I just want to make sure, Yakya, how much more time do I have? Uh, you still have like 17, 18 minutes. Excellent. Because I think this is the moment, after having said all these things, after having inserted all these different parameters, after having done all this name and term dropping on you, which is, I apologize in advance. I might look aggressive on my part that I'm, you know, I'm unloading all these concepts, just that I'm trying to condense everything into a few sentences. So what I'd like to do for the rest of, let's say, 60 minutes more or less, is to read with you hmm, some of the sentences that I have singled out from the seven pages I suggested that you read, and try this time to interpret these sentences in the light of what I have said so far. Is that okay? So let's do this. So um, I don't know, I, 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 in case you don't all have right now in front of you the PDF version of the book, it would be possible, perhaps, if someone has a share screen um, license to uh, upload the PDF of my book for all of you to see so that you can also see it on screen. I mean, on, I mean on, the, on the room screen. I don't know, Yakia, what do you think? We should, should we do that? I think some people will have the PDF and some others won't. So it will be useful if we could do it, but I'm not sure how... Can I share? I can do, do I it. have the Do I have the license? Because I don't I don't think I have it. Okay, so I don't think that's a question for me. You just jump uh, mm -hmm. I think you have to go to something like the settings. You, ah, let me see, you let have permission. There is a button to share secret. I think... I think yeah. you have permission, they say. Let me let me check. Just give me one second and I will check this out. Okie dokie. So this is my book. I'm going back to Zoom. I'm going here. Then I go share screen. And then... Uh, ba -ba -ba so the thing is, so far I see I can only share... No. Advanced files. Okay, I have to go to files. And then I have to go to drop... Uh, Dropbox. No, no, it doesn't work this way. Let's do it now. Just give me one second to see if I can solve this. No, it shouldn't be like this. Advanced portion of screen, uh, computer audio content, second time. No. It has to be somewhere below Windows. The reason is that 
on my side, the only type of windows I see that I can share are browser windows. I don't see uh, PDFs, and I do have some PDFs open right now. Ah, uh, okay, I found it. Good. Here it is. Can you see it now? Yes, I, I can see it. Is that okay? Perfect. Excellent. My apologies for, for this mess. I was just trying to find a way. So, okie dokie. Uh, let me go to the relevant page that I'm going to read right now for all of you. Uh, uh, okay. There it is. Excellent. And I don't know whether, should I magnify a little bit the... Um, This um, no. oh, there it is. Perfect. A little bit more. Okay, is it visible now? Is it okay? Good. Okay, so I'm reading from page twenty-one. So it's twenty-one of the the PDF version of the book, and I say. My aspiration for originality is limited to only one sense, and this sense is not taxonomic, which is the first part of the book, but metaphysical. Even by some metaphysical concerns that I will spell out further downstream, I will replay the model question of whether governance by law is necessarily or contingently coercive with what I will label the metric question of how much legally inexorable state coercion is. And a few sentences further down, so in the, the next paragraph, I say the following. Inexorability, which you now remember, you could understand it also in terms of safety, security, or difficult or hardly falsifiable. Okay, that is the idea of inexorability. So I say that inexorability is not a direct attribute of situations involving state coercion, but rather of the truth of propositions about the legal relevance of such situations. So this is my first step of abstraction. You see what I'm doing here. So this is where me, I choose to make things a little bit more complicated. Okay, Because I move from the level of saying, is law coercive? How much coercive? To going to the level of the proposition itself and saying, is this proposition true? And if it is true, how safely true is this proposition? This is the metric approach. The how, how safe is a metric question. It's a matter of degree. Okay. I know it sounds a little bit naive at the first level so to talk about how safe a truth is. But there is a way to make that more regimented eventually. Okay, so that's that's one sentence that I wanted to um, to focus on, and then I go further down to the next page. So this is page twenty-two. I scroll further down, and you get further up. Sorry. Okay, there it is. And I say the following. Mm -hmm. uh, no, it's not this one. The metric question. There it is. I say that the dimension of inexorability, so this is the middle paragraph, the dimension, and maybe I can also do this so that you can see. Okay. The dimension of inexorability is often expressed by way of asking ourselves how difficult will it be for the proposition that state coercion is relevant in this or that way, and now you know that this or that way means in an axiological way or in a deontic way. Okay? So, how difficult it would be for the proposition that state coercion is legally relevant in this or that way to fail to be true. Okay, full stop here. This is a very interesting point because it's the word fail. Right? Why do we care about security and safety if what we don't, what, what we really care about is the notion of failure. I mean, that applies also across the board of, when, of, of the context in which we use the word safety and security. We care about security and we care about safety because we know that sometimes it's quite possible for things to go bad and fail. 
this is more or less now this analogy that we, in, in this case, failure, the failure is the failure of falsification. In other words, a certain proposition about the way in which state coercion is important, legally relevant, huh? fail. How does it fail? Well, if you change the main context in which it obtained huh? and you put it in a different context, then by the lights of that other context, unfortunately, this proposition does not remain true anymore. It has become falsified. So the more difficult I read it is for something to fail to be the case, the more inexorable the truth of a statement about it will be. By analogy, the more difficult it is for the proposition that a situation about state coercion is legally relevant in a certain way to fail to be true, the more inexorable or secure its truth. And a little bit further down. Here. I say, more generally then, for any, any true proposition P or pi, how easily this proposition could have failed to be true depends on how great, here comes the metric now, Ellen, how great a departure from actuality is required for this proposition not to be true anymore. So we move from the idea of safety to the idea of distance, or if you see it as an action, departure. Think of it as traveling. We are traveling with our mind. We travel uh, from one world into another world. One world understands law, the making of law in a particular way, and another world that is more or less far from our world understands law to be made in a different way. And once we travel from the original actual world to that other world that is farther away from us, what we take with us in terms of baggage, if you like, is certain statements that we also made in the original world, and we simply want to carry them with us and test them in the context of the other world where we have been. And the idea is the following. If the distance between the two worlds in which we travel, so I begin from actuality, always actuality is the point of departure, and actuality is always defined conventionally. Actuality is whichever theory we take as our point of departure. You see what I'm doing here? I'm not talking about actuality as the real, real actuality because we don't know what the actuality of law is. We suppose that certain theory is the correct theory. Then we say, okay, let's take Dworkin theory, for example, as the actuality, okay? The actuality of how law is made. And remember, Dworkin says that both legal norms and also coercive practices that enforce legal norms are understood, are individuated in completely moral terms, right? And also he says that both legal norms, but also the coercive uh, decisions of lawmakers and law enforcers, they provide reason for action. He says that. So this is his world, okay? And then we want to see how certain statements of working about the importance of coercion in law, how would the statements do if we changed what? the context in which we understand how law is made. And you know what happens, for example, in the case of Dworkin? In the case of Dworkin, if, if you take a statement about coercion into another world, this statement becomes immediately false. And you know why? The reason is that for Dworkin, both lawmaking actions and actions of enforcement are individuated and relevant in exactly the same way. So the moment you go into a very different world, so different individuation, different relevance, this statement it stops to be true because, because coercive acts and lawmaking acts 
are relevant and individuated in only in the way in which Dworkin takes the actuality to be. If you go to another world, for example, to the world of how, how Joseph Rad understands the making of law, huh? in that context, these statements that Dworkin makes about coercion, so for example, Dworkin says that um, uh, law, uh, legal practices should be, uh, should be um, uh, interpreted in a way that minimizes in a principled way the exercise of state coercion. I repeat, this is sorry, this is a statement of Dworkin about state coercion. He says that legal practices, all kinds of legal practices, should be interpreted in a way that minimizes in a principled way the exercise of state coercion. So if you take this statement away from the actuality as Dworkin understands it and you put it in another context, it becomes immediately false. Why? Because the criteria for understanding the truth of this statement and the criteria for understanding uh, Dworkin's statements about how it is made are exactly the same. So you can really differentiate things in Dworkin. And that is why, and with this I think I'm going to conclude because we should discuss a bit more about that. That is why I think that according to my model, for example, Dworkin's theory about the legal relevance of coercion is a theory that treats truths, truths about the legal importance of coercion as very, very, very shaky, very, very, very fragile. Why? Because Dworkin cannot move away from the actuality of how law is made. This is also compatible with what Dworkin has many times said and acknowledged in different parts of his of uh, his critics. So in the criticism he has received, he has said many times that, you know what? I, I don't mind saying, he has said, whether others see my theory of law as parochial, which means local, focused, for example, on the American jurisprudential practice. I say, I don't find this to be a problem, I think that nonetheless it can be super informative, even if the things that I say in the context of this actuality uh, would not hold, would not be true, if we moved on to alternative ways of configuring the law. So Dworkin, in this sense, is a parochialist. Uh, and that's actually informative in which sense. I guess we would all agree that uh, we think that Partly the, the, the reintroduction of the concept of coercion into law came thanks to Dworkin, right? I mean, we have associated interpretivism in his theory partly with a theory about what makes coercion permissible. So we might have thought that if that is the case, and if Dworkin is the one who brought coercion back into the discussion, then that also means that coercion is super important for Dworkin. Well, According to this alternative approach, I will tell you that it is super important only in a super parochial way, because it, it, the truth uh, of these statements that he makes about coercion cannot survive outside of the context of that theory. It cannot travel too much. There are other theories that allow you to travel far away and still the way these theories understand coercion uh, hold. They remain true even if the world as we understand the making of law, has changed a lot. Thank you very much for your attention, and I'm open to any questions and discussion. Thank you so much once again. Thank you very much, Tria, for your uh, presentation. Do you prefer that the PDF is actually on mute? Perfect. Okay. Do we have any questions or comments? Just a second, I... By the way, part of the questions could be also if you would like me or you to read or focus on a particular sentence, by the way. Uh, that could also be the case, not just a question, yeah. but a specific yeah. sentence. Uh, Abdullah, please. Hello. Um, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, can thank you hear you. me? Yes, I do. I do. I can hear you. Uh, I actually could read just the uh, seven pages that you recommended. So okay. uh, my questions are much more explanatory. So perfect. Would you, could you follow? Would you guide me in the in the specific parts that you want to talk about? Actually, um, 
you, you I, explained I, it a lot. I'm, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, can, I'm interrupting, but can, can you also please very briefly introduce yourself before? Um, okay, before. my name is Abdullah Hada. I'm a PhD student under uh, Professor Gülür Zürgür. Um, I'm writing my PhD thesis on uh, topic of progress in philosophy of law. Actually, uh, I'm very inter interested in your work because you're, you so as, far, as far as I know, you're interested in the same topic. So um, my question yes. is kind of relevant. My second question, actually. Yes. Uh, um, my, my first question is, um, you're, you're, um, I, I couldn't quite understand the difference between the um, modality or, uh, you know, like the uh, contingency the and necessity talk. Uh, yeah, and the metric approach. It feels like it is the same thing. Like, you know, the mm -hmm. safety principle in epistemology, like uh, they are talking whether our uh, knowledge is safe or not. Uh, so it's like the same thing, but I, I don't quite get the difference between these things. Like, uh, you, I actually don't think you have to excellent distinguish question. between them. Abdullah, excellent question. Yeah, th th this is the first question, actually. The, um, the, okay. the second question, uh, yes. I feel like, still explanatory because as i said i couldn't read the uh, full uh, full book uh, the question yeah. is um it feels like um no actually i i got to ask another question if it's possible uh, because oh, it, it, it's uh, you may, you make a distinction between actuality uh, and theories no, not a distinction actually i feel like there's a distinction between theories and actuality and i feel like theories really? are trying to explain uh, actuality but you say there's an actuality that is actually coming out of the theory itself. I don't know if mm, we are mm, able mm, to, mm, um, it feels like they're lacing into each other. These are two different yes. categories. Uh, this was the second thing. Uh, I'm asking whether it's possible to distinguish these two things. Um, my, my final question is about, um, actually it is related to my PhD thesis too. I'm asking whether, what, what's, what's the aim or value of jurisprudence? Uh, what, what's, why, why should we actually follow your suggestion that uh, we, we uh, you know, adapt your metric uh, approach instead of the right. uh, model, right. model? Because you're, it feels like you're assuming that we, we actually have some kind of understanding of the value of jurisprudence. Um, and against that's why that, I say all the rest. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, these are my questions. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. I mean, amazing questions. So to your first question, well, there are things and things to be said. For example, you are absolutely right that in the epistemological context, the analysis of the word safe and safety is treated as a model notion, right? And what do I mean by it is treated by model notion? So you analyze safety in terms of possible worlds, uh, which is itself a model concept. Uh? So what is possibly the case? Now, as I said, I relied on, on Kuman's approach, uh, which he insists that his approach is actually reductionist. So in other words, he tells you that he wants to replace the model with something that is not model. If you ask me, I will tell you that I don't find the answers he gives in his own books very convincing, but I have another approach that you might find appealing as to why this account is not genuinely model, but something else. And this has to do with the following. What if, instead of talking as I did in terms of necessity and possibility, and then of course I talk about the difficulty in something being falsified. Okay, so I use this expression or the notion of security or the notion of inexorability. Well, my best way in trying to convince you that this second way is not genuinely model is to tell you that the way that I see, metaphysically speaking, these new terms, so inexorability, difficulty in falsification are as disposition, disposition. And that opens up into an entirely different metaphysical domain, which is not the domain of modality. So it's in the domain of powers and dispositions and there, in that domain, actually, the idea is that modality is always reduced in terms of disposition. So the notion of how easy for something to be the case. For example, think of, of um, terms like fragility. Mm -hmm. So those metaphysicians who take disposition seriously 
they don't tell you that these are models. They give sometimes model descriptions of how they work, but they think that their nature is primitive. Okay. They don't tell you that they are themselves metaphysical, uh, sorry, model, because they're not about possibility. Okay. One thing is to talk about something, uh, let's say, being that something breaks easily, and something else to say that it is possible that it will break. Okay, the second is model. The first one, uh -huh. according to the orthodoxy, at least in the discussion, is that talk in terms of dispositions is not is not the same as talk in terms of possibility. Okay, of course, this is open for discussion, and so I'm not. So it could be a perfectly legitimate objection on your part that at least within the context of this book, I haven't convinced you enough uh, that I'm really departing from the model. Uh, let's say the the model content. If, even if that is the case, I will tell you that at least what I have done, even if it doesn't look very different from model, is to replace uh, replace the words the words necessity and contingency with another family of words that I think in the particular context is much more intuitive, and it also helps you to describe different theories in a more joint carving way, if you like. So that will be my answer for the first question. Um, coming now to uh, your second question about actuality and theory. So there is a moment uh, in, in the book, actually, I think it's a footnote where I talk about uh, a colleague of mine. His name is Lucas Mioto, huh? and um, he's, been reading, he's been writing extensively on the concept of coercion in law. And, you know, as we always do in a book, I try also to engage with, um, with people who write as we speak on this concept, so younger people. And... Um, in in his book, he, he talks about, he doesn't use the word actuality, he uses the word typicality. And he says that, he keeps a model account, by the way, he doesn't go outside of the model context. And he says, well, there is an intuitive sense in which certain legal systems are typical. This is what he says, okay? So whether coercion, he says, is contingent or necessary, has to be examined in relation to what we take a legal system to be typical, okay? So this is Lucas Miotto's way of approaching the issue. He doesn't use the word actuality again. Now, here comes me, where I say the following. Well, I want to use both the notions of actuality and typicality, but in a typicality in a different way. I say, for me, legal actuality, and I say that in a footnote, is the reality the reality of how law is typically made. See what I'm doing here. And you might say, what do you mean, Tria, here by typically? Well, typically here I mean by the lights of the category used by a particular theory. Not typically subspecie eternitatis. Typic typos in Greek and, and type, uh, the original sense is a sense like a basic category for making classification, right? like a generic toolbox, if you like, much like we use the word species when we talk about human or infant, for example, okay? So typically here is in the sense of the, the category, so the basic concepts and words used by a particular theory. And then I say, this is how I want to understand legal actuality, as the reality of how law is made according to the categorical or categorical, if you like, lights, of a particular theory of law. Of course, you might say again, yeah, but how is that actuality? I think you're bringing theory too much into the actual. But then I will tell you that most model theories, are, even when they talk about actualities, what they actually do is, you know what? They are doing, uh, they are reconstructing what do we call logical space. Logical space. So actuality is only one such part of logical space that we show that is our minds, happen to inhabit and for which to have a particular point of view. Uh, there is nothing more to this notion of actuality than this way of locating ourselves in logical space. And there's an excellent book, by the way, you might find it interesting on that matter, by um, a philosopher whose name is Augustine, uh, Augustine, see, Augustine Rayo, R-A-Y-O, and his book is called The Construction of Logical Space. And this is a book to which partly I've been inspired by that book in talking about how we understand actuality. And finally, with your third question, and I'm sorry that I'm lagging behind in other questions, about the value of jurisprudence. 
Um, for me, the, va the value of jurisprudence cannot be disentangled from the value of any other domain of practical philosophy that tries to make sense of what action is, uh, action, agency, and all that kind of stuff. So the value of jurisprudence has to be the value of making uh, uh, action more intelligible in all respects. So I wouldn't say anything more than that. And if you like, I mean, of course, we can, you know, we can hook up online and, you know, exchange our views and we'll be more than happy to, to discuss about this further. Thank you so much once again for your question. Uh, thank you very much for great responses. Thank, thank you, you for the question thank you. Thank you. Uh, Do we have any further uh, questions, comments, or discussions? Okay, I think there is one written question, uh, Tria. Okay. Uh, do, do I need to check the chat box? I think so, yes. If, if you prefer, let I think me, just... Let, let me, because right now my... Ah, there it is. Okay, let me go to the chat box. Okay, doke. I'm just reading the question. I will read it also for everyone. Uh, one second, please. Okay, so uh, this is uh, a state. So all other layers of legal reality are grounded. This is my statement. So all other layers of legal reality are grounded in the reality uh, of lawmaking. Here, what is meant by the word lawmaking, the lawmaking of the legislative or a lawmaking process participated by individuals, groups, and institutions, that their demands and forcing the legislative to, ah, okay, I get it. Okay, 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 okay. Uh, good. So, excellent question. Um, this is actually something that I, so I, I think that was last May. I published an article on, on the journal Jurisprudence, and the title of this article is What, what Makes Law? And then in italics, law. So I, I, I italicize the word, the second word law. So what makes law law? Uh, categorical trends in in um, uh, analytic legal metaphysics. And in that article, I say that the word lawmaking is systematically ambiguous, okay? Um, and it's systematically ambiguous, not, be not because of anything having to do with uh, how laypersons understand lawmaking, but with how legal philosophers understand. And there is actually, uh, there is also an analog you can find in more general metaphysics, uh, where, for example, there's been an explosion, an explosion of what they call building metaphor. So in other words, grounding, uh, realization, multiple realizations. These are metaphysical relations that certain philosophers want to treat as something like building something out of something. Now, lawmaking, you could also understand it as something, building something out of something. And of course, you might say that legislation is also the same. I mean, literally, legislation is the more Latin version of the word lawmaking, which is the more Germanic English version of the word. Now, of course, that is possible. But I say that it is better to keep the word legislation in its ordinary sense, so as the empirical procedure, let's say, or promulgating particular laws, uh, in particular, let's say, um, uh, institution, so it could be a parliament uh, or what have you, okay, so legislation. And then I have reserved the word lawmaking from something more abstract. And this is the idea of how law is made from something that it is not law itself. So this is the building metaphor that, uh, for example, a piece, a, a brick is not in itself a house. When you put many bricks together, you make a house. The house is made out of the configuration of the bricks. It is not a brick itself. It comes from them. It is built through them and perhaps by them, also with the help of, those, of the builders. Okay. So the way I understand lawmaking and lawmaking fact uh, in this particular book is much more abstract. And it is similar to these metaphysical relations that I already mentioned. So, for example, the language of grounding. For example, there are many legal philosophers, as we speak, that try to understand how legal facts, that's the language they use, are grounded in non-legal facts. 
this is a case of lawmaking according to what I want to say. So legal facts are made by non-legal facts. So the way I use the expression lawmaking here is in this very, very abstract sense. I hope that makes some sense. Thank you very much for the question and as well uh, for, for the answer. Do we have any further questions? If not, I have one, but I'll wait for other uh, participants first and then ask if I have time. Why not? Yeah, yeah, come on. Okay. Shoot. Okay, okay then. Uh, now, uh, Tria, I'm kind of baffled, actually, uh, both by the book and by your presentation, but your presentation made things much clearer for me. That's uh, that's for sure. I don't want, I don't know how, you know, which one I should start with, but let's start with this one. Now, uh, and I'll ask like these small questions and if you can answer, then I'll, I'll uh, just move on more with more confidence. Now, this world, the actualities, let's, let's call them as you do, these actualities are, they, they need to be similar in some way, right? while judging the inexorability of uh, truths about legal relevance of coercion, these different worlds that we travel to, although they are different, they should be similar in some some ways, or not. I mean, uh, I would Similarity say... and difference, similarity and difference are, if you see them as a, in spectral terms, so as a spectrum, it is a matter of more or less, so the farther you go, the less similar. Or the farther you go, the more different. Up to the point, by the way, that's the one interesting point that I don't touch at all in the book. Mm -hmm. It is also possible that you can arrive in a world that is unrecognizable huh, from the lights of, of your point of departure. Yes. It is as if you are going into another parallel universe, if you like. Yes. Okay. Yes. So that's the that's the metaphor, if you like. Okay. So um, yeah. But it's also acceptable. Like you can also travel to an unrecognizable uh, world or thing. But in that yeah. case, the truth would be highly uh, inexorable. Is that is that correct? Well, if if it's what now. takes to falsify uh, the truth. No, because why? Because here's now the, the interesting thing. But for that, I have to to start also from 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 modality. In, in model discussions, uh, so those who take modality seriously, they don't only talk about possible worlds, they also talk about impossible worlds. So what a modelist would refer to as an impossible world is the unrecognizable world I've just referred to, okay? Now, uh, there, in that context, the idea is that in impossible worlds, necessity breaks down because we move uh, into the realm of absurdity. This is the, the notion that they use there. The notion, this is absurd anymore. So it doesn't even make sense to talk anymore about, you know, what is, you know, necessary or possible. So by analogy, by analogy, even in the non-model context that I am pro proposing, the idea is that necessity, so play, not necessity, uh, inexorability or security of truths, has, can go as far as there is still a way, see what I'm going to say now, there's still a way in which we can differentiate one world from another. And in order to differentiate a world from another, you need a, a common respect. Something is different from something with respect to something. A measure of comparison. If you also lose the measure of comparison to say how different it is, for example, Black is very different from red. Why? Because they lie on opposite sides of the color spectrum, right? But we are still talking about color. We are still talking about color. If we travel so, so far away, the color stops being a respect of difference or similarity, everything breaks down. It's another universe. Welcome to a new world. Start everything from scratch. So in that case, in order to uh, determine the level of inexorability about of truth about the legal relevance of sanction we would start with the legal theory and then move on one. to a specific one yes and then move on to perhaps another legal theory all right but can we say that perhaps never 
to a physical theory. With physical? Yes, like, like physics, a theory of physics. Ah, ah, okay, now I get it. So you mean that our traveling, ah, wait, wait, that's very interesting. So you are saying that traveling is not traveling across different legally configured worlds. You are talking about traveling from legally configured worlds to non-legally configured worlds up to the most basic atomic level. Is that what you're saying? Yes. I mean, is that possible? Like, is that is that a route that we would take, you know, well, to determine the inexorability? Not in this book. Yeah. And the reason has to do with the following, yeah, yeah. I mean, what you're actually describing is what we call a grounding chain, right? Mm -hmm. So something more fundamental. So other like other worlds that are more fundamental so for example the the most basic quantum physics i don't know what that is okay and the super super non-fundamental by the way fundament i also think that fundamentality is a metric notion but that's a topic for another discussion so the very less fundamental which is the legal and perhaps above the legal is also the um i don't know the institutional and then something else even less so in this case, so grounding, which operates vertically, huh, there is an issue there because the whole literature on grounding and what is more fundamental than what was developed in terms of the reaction or, if you like, rejection of uh, the notion of supervenience. Mm -hmm. If you remember supervenience, is that relation that you understand uh, in terms of differences? Huh? So would moral facts be the same if physical facts were different, right? Yeah, but, but before this, we get carried yeah. away, actually, I, I understand your point, but all, all I need yeah. is that we're not moving vertically, but horizontally, right? I mean, in your suggestion. Yeah. Okay, so if, for, for instance, a legal theory has, well, requires every single legal norm uh, to be coercive, Right. Let's say backed by, let's say backed by uh, sanctions. Then, yes. Then we will move on to another, another theory. Uh, theory where this is not the case. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe from all other as aspects, these two theories will be very similar, but from this aspect they differ. Therefore, the level of inexorability uh, of the truth about the legal relevance of sanctions in the first theory is. Uh, well, it's not safe. Let's let's call it basically. Hmm. Is this true? Because it could only okay. take a small divergence. But, but mm -hmm. since whether legal norms or law should be coerced or not, should be coercive mm -hmm. or not, mm -hmm. is well, it's initially a question about what the law is. Huh. Mm -hmm. Then, if we move to this uh, the other other world. The original theory still has the defense to say, yeah, but what they are talking about there, those thing. legal norms, they are not they are not legal norms. So they do not actually Yeah, yeah, you've changed the topic. Norms. You've changed the topic. Does it say you've changed the topic? So it, 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 comparisons are not are not possible anymore. Is that what you're saying? Yes. So I believe that the modal question is still relevant in some way. Because okay. we first need to know what what coercion is, what law is and is not, and our claims regarding those uh, the truths about the truths of the claims about what the law is, which might or might not include coercion. Um, I, I believe that they, they cannot be inexorable or less or more inexorable based on your your. Okay, that's okay. what I feel. Great. Uh... I'm thinking as as we are discussing right now. Um, I think that touches upon the question of what makes so what makes the theory count so if a legal philosophical theory count as having a core, a core, from the basis of which and in departure from which all the rest can be discussed. Okay, and in this book I say that this core has to be defined by reference to how law is made. This is how I perhaps sophistically articulated the question. And now, let me, can you still see the PDF uh, of the book? Yes. Excellent. So this is in another part of the book. So this is footnote 48. And let me remember exactly, ah, 
So there it is. I say the following. Uh, actually, no, it's part of the of the pages we discussed. So I say a very plausible worry about the way the metric approach understands the re requisite measurements. So the comparison is that it doesn't make any sense to treat governance by law as a whole uh, or a primitive typical legal system as the point of legal actuality from which we start the measurement. The reason is that unless we beg the question whether governance by law is coercive, which is what you're actually saying, we cannot assume that the reality, actuality of tax governance can be wholly described in a way that makes no reference to coercive practices as part of its actual operation. In other words, for scenarios of legally actual, sorry, legally relevant state coercion to be informative in a legal sense, any departure from actual legal situations needs to differ in precisely the sense that the latter are not coercive as such, so how law is made, whereas the former are coercive and yet, despite that, remain true for all jurisdictional purposes. And then I say something in the footnote that I think I should have put in the main text, actually, which is the following. I say, uh, here it is. So, of course, so this is footnote 48. This is not to say that coercive laws, uh, remember, you, you began with this idea that laws are inherently coercive, right? So that the original, perhaps, I don't know, imperative theory of laws also, the Austinian. So coercive laws, that is laws backed up by the threat of sanctions, eh? this is not to say that this cannot be made coercive or that the laws thus and so made are not judicially or administratively enforceable. They are made coercive, but they are not made coercively. Hmm? although they are coercive and enforceable. So I play with this distinction here. And I say, huh? and of course, there is, a, there, is a, there is a moment here where I can still bite the bullet because I say the following. The latter, so the case, uh, the latter concerns the content and the application of the law, not the creation of the law. And then I say, at any rate, if even if we assume huh, that there can exist legal systems where the making of law, where the making of law is nothing over and above the coercive direction of particular actions eh, by the particularized edits of the reg. This is, this is a view, by the way. I'm not saying this is not a view. Eh? I remain confident that I still have most analytical philosophers on my side when I suppose that lawmaking involves the creation of something general and that this generality cannot be metaphysically accounted for by the way coercion or potential coercion works. In other words, and here I could bite the bullet. In other words, the act here. If someone is, metaphysically speaking, a legal particularly particularist in that specific sense, in the sense that legal norms are nothing but the particularized orders. So there's nothing general. It's every time is a particular order and now pronounced by the Rex. Huh? If that is all what law is, then yes, what I say exactly. I'm just saying uh, that I take this to be a marginal view, and precisely because the aim of the book is to compare theories that are already on the market, I've seen that these theories, in their exhaustive almost generality, they begin from the idea that the content of the law is general by its nature. And I say that if it is really general by its nature, regardless of how we understand this generality, then this understanding of particular reason cannot fit into the picture, but of course, this is part of the, like every model, this is a model, by the way, that I propose, every model has limitations. So it cannot represent any type of possible disagreement. Huh? And that is actually, that brings me back to the question of Abdullah about the value of jurisprudence. Perhaps one of the values that we are still missing is, can we construct a way to bring everyone on the, on the same table, coming from any possible understanding of how law is made, and still, because that's the challenge, make sense when we disagree with each other. Instead of simply saying, no, 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 that's not, you see, it's as if we're talking past each other. So that is the idea, the idea of making um, making a norm coercive and making a norm coercively. Right? I think the second one is the particularized order kind of approach that cannot be covered by the model itself. That is more or less the idea, but we should like to discuss it further or whenever you want. Okay, well, I'll just first ask if there are any further questions or do we have like more time, uh, Professor Uyghur? Time is 5.30. Uh, okay, 
Okay, I think it's with six thirty. Six thirty on your side. Yeah, I think time is up. Uh, that's the information <laughs> that I just received. But if there is another uh, question. Uh... Well, I, I have some other things that I would like to discuss with uh, Tiria, but there is no reason to do it like uh, online and here. We can uh, message each other later on. Yeah, so, of course. Uh, so I'll, I'll wait for any other last question. And if not, we will just conclude the meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I, I see no other questions. Uh, Tiria, thank you very much. It was uh, very enlightening. And very uh, exciting discussion. Pleasure was all mine. Thank you so much for honoring me with this. And I would love, I would love to continue this discussion with you uh, later. Absolutely, whenever you want. You, you, and me with a cup of coffee. Okay. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. I'll be, I'll be around in England soon. So maybe we'll, we'll arrange. Something. Currently, I'm in Spain, but we will find a way. We will find a way. We will find a they're, way. They're, they are close by. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you very much, everyone. Bye-bye. Have a lovely, bye -bye. Have a lovely evening. Bye-bye. Thank you so bye -bye. much. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.